was to, to build environments that would facilitate teaching and learning. And in particular, we identified these four different kinds of activities that we wanted to be able to support in classrooms. Uh, activities around presenting materials, around facilitating collaborative work between the instructor and students and among students themselves, uh, activities to engage students in, in the classroom activities, and finally the rich capture of whatever is going on in the classroom. So that, that was our goal, to address these four different things. Sorry? Sure. Um, so when we think about classroom design, most people think in terms of facilities design. And facilities people have a tendency to look far out into the future. I mean, they look at, in a traditional view, the master plan approach, looking 10, 20 years down the road. Well, we want to build a building here. Um, what do we have to do in terms of uh, electrical lines and, and sewer lines to be able to accommodate? that anticipated building. Well, we think that uh, classroom design, uh, because of the technology components, needs to be viewed a little more like IT design. And in fact, IT design also did master plans for a long time. You know, creating an information technology plan was creating a master plan, a strategic long-term plan. But the challenge there is that things change too quickly. So Moore's Law has been unrelenting for 40 years, and Moore's Law is having an impact in the classroom. So we thought we'd be better off looking at a different way of planning. Uh, for us at Columbus State, that meant thinking about design principles at a higher level. And it meant engaging faculty who were the users of the classrooms and students um, in the process. And creating a dialogue, again, not about the nitty-gritty details of what particular technology we're going to implement, but with a higher level understanding of what we want to accomplish in the classrooms. So our effort, our design principles that would guide our decisions would be a result of this collaboration that we tried to build across campus. And wherever possible, our design decisions should be based on uh, empirical studies and research. Now, the, the inspiration for our approach came from uh, s something called the Oregon Experiment, conducted by an architect named Christopher Alexander many years ago at the University of Oregon. Uh, it's documented in a series of three books that uh, I think they're Oxford University Press. Now, this is one of them, the Oregon Experiment. There's the timeless way of building and a pattern language. <clears throat> Central to the approach, and the approach involved the same kind of things we were just talking about, engaging the entire community in articulating a set of standards, a set of patterns in Christopher Alexander's vocabulary, which are design principles. And in fact, throughout the Oregon experiment, 253 of these design principles were articulated that guided the design of everything at the University of Oregon campus. Uh, from big issues as to where to place uh, the campus in relationship to natural resources through very tiny little design decisions. Those patterns, or again principles, are used to assess the existing spaces, to prioritize which project to do, and to guide the design of the buildings and all the components of the university. Now, we thought that this approach, while we weren't going to try to replicate the incredible work done at the University of Oregon, this was a huge, massive project, a uh, 20-year experiment, um, we thought that the approach would work. And, and in fact, at the University of Pittsburgh, I spent 40 years at the University of Pittsburgh, we took this approach to design a, an information technology strategic plan uh, 20 years ago. The six general principles that are used in the Oregon experiment are these, and I want to talk about each one of these a little bit and show a parallel as to how we use them 
at uh, Columbus State. So these are uh, Christopher Alexander's six guiding principles. <clears throat> the first was this principle of participation. And in Alexander's words, decisions about what you should build and how to build it should be in the hands of users because the users know best about what they need. We took that to mean that at Columbus State we would create cross-functional classroom design team uh, to represent the interests of the campus and they would be engaged on a daily basis but would also engage the entire Columbus State community. Uh, faculty, staff, lots of faculty. And create this open process for setting the standards and uh, measuring or assessing the classroom space, the, the rubrics that we use for that, and planning for the renovations. So that was our interpretation of the Alexander participation principle. So this is our cross-functional team. It had four folks from, from IT and network guy, Martin Barry, who's the manager of media services, uh, the computer lab supervisor, and a classroom engineer, and two folks from the instructional technology group that reports up a different chain in, in the hierarchy of the organization to the academic side. Uh, lots of focus groups and open forums, et cetera, with faculty, specific uh, open focus groups with public safety folks and facilities folks and classroom scheduling folks. So that was our, our core team. Our approach was to, to start with a working document that I drafted from the original assessment that Campus Works had done a year before, um, where I had a chance to come onto campus and, and review technology. Um, our understanding of best practice and ex experiences at lots of different institutions, and the existing practices at Columbus State. So we formed a draft document, and then that draft document went through multiple iterations with this core authoring team that I just mentioned on the previous, the previous slide. The core authoring team then interfaced with all these different campus groups, the shared governance, mainly faculty committees. Um, we surveyed faculty. We held open forums and focus groups. We looked at user usage statistics, and we talked with individual faculty who we considered uh, influence leaders and went through an iterative process to design this standards document, which we've posted on the, the site, the uh, CCUMC site, so you can get, um, you can download the latest uh, draft. Uh, so we went through this iterative pr um, cycle process of publishing a new version, debating, discussing, presenting, and revising. We did that lots of times within the small core team and only twice with the big community. Uh, we work with two particular shared governance committees, the Instructional Success Committee and the Curriculum Committee, and um, have recommended the creation of, uh, there's actually 10 of these shared governance committees. We recommended the creation of an 11th committee, and that's currently uh, being I, th I think there's actually movement on that, and that's Classroom Technology Advisory Committee. Uh, Alexander's second principle is uh, organic order. And basically the principle says that when you define an architecture for classrooms in this principle-based approach, you know, these are my words now, that the architecture will essentially evolve over time as you make individual implementations of them. And basically, it's a recognition of the fact you can't change everything overnight, that things are evolving and are evolving quickly. So to deal with those issues and keep it on track, we also propose the creation of a recurring budget. I mean, classroom design, as it is in most places I've visited, is kind of ad hoc. You know, you get some money and you address some some rooms, or there's a new building built and you have money to deal with the classroom design. Instead, we believe we need to take the same kind of approach that everybody pretty much has accepted as life cycle approach to computer technology and network technology. Let's apply that to all the components of a classroom. 
And uh, we thought that it's best to create a cross-functional classroom management team to keep the principles, so to speak, the design principles, and to assess the spaces. Uh, we've actually done that at the University of Pittsburgh for about 20 years now with really good effect. Alexander's third rule was the rule of piecemeal growth. And I think it ties really closely to the last one. That is that you really have a, big, a bigger impact over time in moving forward with an architectural change by implementing lots of small product, projects than you do with few very big projects. So the, the whole life cycle approach, replacement approach is important to this, as is the, the um, classroom management team and their monitoring <coughs> activities. Now this one is, is, I think, the core of the Alexander approach, the patterns. So in the University of Oregon, all the design and construction decisions are guided by this collection of principles, he called patterns, uh, that make up what he called a pattern language. So that you could use that language to describe projects. Uh, again, we, did, we weren't quite as elaborate as the Oregon experiment, but we did define these, these principles and we defined them in terms of what we wanted them to accomplish, not the specifics of how they would accomplish them. So to give you an example of, this is one of um, the Alexander examples from about the middle of that pack of 253. It's called the light on both sides of a room. So what they noticed was that when you have a room that has lighting from two different sides, natural lighting, people prefer that room to one exactly equivalently equipped, but with light on one side. And it's for some you know, theoretical reasons. The, the light is, is harsher in a room on the right. There are shadows. It's harder to understand somebody speaking than the well-lit person. I, personally, I, I, this resonates with me. If I take off my glasses, I can't hear you nearly as well as what I wear my glasses. So I think that visual piece is important. Now, Alexander observed people when they were given a choice of which room to get into, and he surveyed them afterwards about how the meeting went and how productive it was. So it came to the conclusion that whenever possible, you should build a room that has two sources of light, two different sides. Now the implications for building a building is that you don't have many square buildings. You have these odd-shaped buildings because they give you lots more possibilities for introducing that idea. Well, that's one of the Alexander design principles. So we wanted to do the same thing, make the same kind of approach with ours. We wanted to define classroom design principles or patterns driven by their pedagogic function, communally adopted, that is we wanted people to buy into them and state what they are. We wanted to test them wherever possible. We wanted to review them for relevance regularly to make sure that they're still pertinent. Um, we wanted to use them to determine priority among projects. That is, if a project is proposed that matches our principles, it gets a higher priority than one that doesn't. Uh, the one that doesn't gets sent back to the drawing room to rethink it and hand it a copy of the standards. Um, and we want to use the principles to actually assess the space so that we can determine what those priorities ought to be. So in the end, we defined 21 core principles that we thought every classroom should have. And again, you can see these things online. Um, eight desired ones that, for one reason or another, they may be more expensive or more controversial, um, that need to be in every classroom. Some experimental ones that weren't 100% clear whether or not they're going to have the impact that we wanted. And a couple extra principles for, that address the computer labs. So those design principles are at the heart of our work. Those 35 design principles. And here's the uh, you know, brief summary statement of the first five, just to give you a sense of what they're doing. Classrooms should be safe. There should be some, at least one defined stage area where you can make a presentation if that's what you want to do. There should be at least one ad hoc writing surface so that students can see that surface. 
there should be a teaching station, et cetera. Um, we, we thought it important to sort of test these things as we were def defining them, and we, we did some surveys, we did some research. Um, for example, looked at um, what faculty might be bringing into the classroom, what kind of laptops were out there. So to figure out what was coming, we went to the web and searched for the best of, you know, the best computer for your returning student, the best computer for games, the best. And we came up with a couple of these different lists in 2011, 2012, it was done in, uh, in March, and identified 40 laptops and then researched the laptops. Two of them we couldn't get enough information in to include, and there's, there's the breakdown of what kind of laptops they were. We were looking at what kind of images they projected and, and what kind of interfaces they had. Um, of those laptops, every one of them was 16 by 9 resolution, except for the two Macs, which were 16 by 10. So they were all wide aspect ratio, yet in every classroom on campus, there were four by three aspect ratio projectors. So those are one of the first things we thought needed to change as a result of the, of the research. And uh, our new standard would articulate that we should be in alignment with those kind of, that kind of research. We also looked at ports and VGA ports, analog ports have not disappeared. 80% uh, of that group of, of PCs contained them. HDMI was bigger than we thought, so we included that in the standard and made decisions on that basis. Another example of how to apply those design decisions, well, there's, there's um, uh, a principle that says the stage area should have a writing surface, and the natural things that pop into people's minds are, should that be a chalkboard or a whiteboard? And big debate, and I, especially among math faculty. I used to teach math, and, and they really love their chalkboards and really don't want to get rid of chalkboards. Uh, but when you think about providing that surface in relationship to the other principles, like create a safe and secure environment, chalk gets a little questionable. Uh, making equipment reliable, chalk gets more questionable. And when you combine it with other things, like the idea of a digital annotation device that was in the second group, the desired features, um, when you think about the move to the 16 by 9 aspect ratio displays and what that means for projection screens, you might come to the conclusion a projectable whiteboard surface might make sense. Um, chalk was a big deal, and Martin, uh, walking down a hall one day, saw this site to kind of demonstrate that chalk uh, might not be the healthiest environment for people or computers. Um, the fifth uh, principle from, from Alexander is that you, you needed to do this ongoing process of diagnosis and evaluation to make sure that the principles you're defining are still good, that they're still relevant, uh, that none of them have been supplanted. And we thought we would do that with a series of surveys uh, by mining data from the Extron switches and further, that would actually use the principles to create an instrument to measure the health of a classroom. That is, well, we'll talk about that in a sec. So here's an example from the faculty survey on instructional technologies. We asked faculty to rate the importance to their teaching of 20 existing technologies in the classrooms uh, with lots of open-ended questions and and this is one of the results. This was the importance of the computer built into the classroom. And uh, about 70% of the classrooms had computers built in at this time. So faculty agreed that they were extremely important uh, for the most part. We also took those ratings, those extremely moderately average, and converted them to numbers and created a, a QPA and ranked how faculty thought each of those 20 technologies was important. At the top of the list were, surprise, the building computer, the data projector, a preview monitor, which I guess I was a little surprised that people valued it as much as, uh, as they did. And at the bottom of the list was 
VHS, and I think the microphone being low is a function of the fact that most of the classrooms are a reasonable size. Most faculty don't need that voice reinforcement. Overhead transparency projector is still there, but um, lower on the list. So this informed us. We did a second survey, and this survey was kind of neat. We decided it needed to be a smart survey. So we, one of the folks in IT, a guy named Josh Schlaven, wrote a database application. It wasn't really a survey, so that a faculty member could, when prompted by an email message, log into a site and see a different survey for each of the rooms that they were teaching in that particular term. This was done over the summer term. They were asked to grade the classroom components on the scale that they're familiar with, A through E. And because it was a database application instead of a survey, they could go back to it over and over and over again to change the results. So the thinking was that they rank the classroom and then they teach it the next day and think, oh, I should have said this. Well, they can go and change it. And in fact, uh, I believe many did return and, and make editorial comments. Uh, this is a picture of the survey. The, the, the analyst actually created a generic tool that will let them create these surveys um, very, very simply. And uh, a picture of some of the results. This was the, the last, the 19th question actually, overall quality of the room. So we could, we could measure how many A's it received, how many B's. So overall the picture is not terrible, it's like uh, about 90% are satisfied with the classrooms overall and 100% of the people, almost 100% of the people who got the survey took the survey. We had a pretty good return rate on this, about 40% as compared to the other traditional survey, about 15%. This allowed us also to create a, a snapshot of the rooms. So here we took the QPAs for all of the 18 plus the overall um, categories the faculty rated. And this was a, a low rated room, so you can see that uh, the numbers aren't great. They're under, everything is under a B. Um, there's some C's and D's in there. And there's a picture of a higher rated room. So this helps us look at which rooms are working well for, for faculty. It gives us a sort of quantitative measure it allowed us to focus on every component of the classroom. So for instance, the data video projector is, is rated like this across all of the rooms. Uh, we really focused on detail in the rooms that had um, at least five, I think, ratings from different instructors on them, uh, but reported everything. In all, these are that list of uh, 27 rooms that had at least five faculty rating them. The numbers weren't as great as I would have wanted because this was a summer term, but again, this allowed us to take a look at which classrooms were, um, that's a D, that one on the bottom, that is not a good classroom to teach in, and which classrooms faculty liked teaching in. So this was an average of the averages, so to speak. There were 402 classrooms, 302 were represented on survey. Again, it was a summer survey and not everybody responded. Um, this is the, that last act, I think I already started talking about this, that, that where our next step is to translate the principles into a rating sheet that members of this committee can go to each classroom, probably we're anticipating it'll take about 15 minutes per room to rate the room according to that sheet and use that rating against the principals to determine which are the healthiest and which classrooms are in need of, of help. And finally, the last uh, of the Alexander principles is that of coordination, and that is that you move forward on this new architecture by dealing with um, a process, creating a process that regulates the stream. And again, that's, that's the idea of if somebody proposes a classroom, and this happens all the time, a faculty member gets a grant, a department gets extra money, and they want to start changing classrooms, well now, whether or not they can proceed with that classroom design 
is going to be determined based on how well they're implementing the principles. And they need to modify it if it doesn't. So to govern that, we proposed the creation of this classroom management team that would monitor the condition and performance of the classrooms. They would manage the renovations, suggest priorities to the, the chief academic officer and the CIO, and um, keep the principles healthy. We're proposing that it has essentially that same core team that wrote it with the addition of some permanent faculty who are representing some of those committees that worked on it, um, two people from facilities and a person from classroom scheduling. So this is still in a proposal stage. It hasn't been formalized yet. So that's where we are. Um, we've created this draft document. It's gone through lots of iterations with faculty committees. We're scheduling open forums still to um, make sure everybody is happy with it and uh, vetting it through the shared governance process. Uh, in the meantime, we, on the basis of this work, tr triggered a project, a proposal called the Smart Classroom Initiative to address the 82 rooms that had no technology. So 82 out of the 402 had nothing built in them. Uh, and that was approved and funded. So 36 of those rooms have been created in, by uh, the beginning of the fall term um, in line with the new standards. So it's, it's underway. The rest of them, of those 82, will be addressed uh, the remainder of this fiscal year. What we're after are classrooms that adhere to as many of the design principles as possible, that have a consistent look and feel of a Columbus State classroom. Um, learned the value of that from Mark's work at the uh, University of Florida, where you could tell you're in a Florida classroom when you walked in. Um, accommodate the discipline-specific requirements of local faculty, not just a cookie cutter approach and evolve on an ongoing basis to meet needs. So at the end of this process, um, we think it's valuable to engage a community in creating these things, um, to creating the principles, to vet them through them, to hold discussions uh, on those principles and to articulate them and to make them focus not on the choices of technology but on what we want to accomplish. Uh, that we should validate them whenever we can with research and analytics, that we should use them to assess the health of classrooms and tell us which ones we ought to address, uh, that that all should be done with a cross-functional team that will perform that tactical work and, and make those decisions, uh, that we should fund classroom technology in a life cycle approach as we do computers, and that we should review and correct those design principles regularly. So that's it. Thank you. Excuse me. Okay, while we're getting the technology ready for the second group, I'm going to introduce them. Um, this is Enterprise Audiovisual Moving Past Project by Project Thinking. And our presenters are Matthew Silverman from George Mason University and Jeremy Parker from Virginia Commonwealth University. Matthew is a project manager with the Learning Space Design Group at George Mason University. He assists with the design of AV and IT systems for learning spaces, coordinates construction activities related to technology upgrades, has over 15 years of, of experience in AV and IT. He holds a CTS, a DMCD, and a PMP certificate, certificate um, certification, and he's very active in both Infocom and right here with us at CCUMC. Jeremy has worked for uh, Virginia Commonwealth University for 14 years and is a certified, Crestron certified programmer. In that time, they designed a campus-wide classroom technology system that blends 
technological trends, system stability, and a common user experience. So two years ago, they began comparing notes. And today, they will share lessons learned along the way and initiatives for the future. Thank you very much. Mike Lovell's okay? Am I not blowing people away? Fantastic, because last time, yeah, he kind of uh, shattered a couple of eardrums. So, um, also want to uh, recognize one other colleague, uh, Dwayne Smith from Old Dominion University. We've actually been working on this, I think, what about a year now, and we presented this at a local show in Virginia, and Dwayne, unfortunately, was unable to make the trip as well this year, so uh, he did contribute content uh, to this presentation. So where we want to kind of start off with is actually very similarly, we've been kind of developing a model, if you will, where we started looking at what does it mean to support, um, support AV in an enterprise style, like an enterprise IT style. One of the things that we found was a lot of the thought, particularly coming from administrations, always treated every AV project as a singularly unique event in time. And we weren't having consistency. We were having classrooms that changed every time you had a new project. We had project managers who liked to put their own little stamp on things. And little subtle variations. Uh, my favorite one from George Mason was once we had, I think, one room we called it a doc cam, and, and, and another room it was a document cam. And one faculty member actually pointed this out and said, why? Why aren't you guys coordinating? So it's something that we've been talking a lot about in Virginia with the uh, schools. And so we kind of came up with this model as we were talking about it, which is four domains and then within sustain, there's a little bit more. What we're really looking at is architect, which is standards, getting into design, getting into, and this is more, I'd say, from a technical perspective, but you know, looking at how do you do design, uh, support, how are you supporting your environment, and then how do you sustain the environment? How do you staff it? How do you budget? And then how do you predict the future? So that's kind of the overview of what we're going to be talking about today. And Jeremy, you can do next one. Uh, I'm going to jump in kind of on the architect, but what I want to kind of start talking about with architect is an area which is near and dear to my heart, which is standards. And the nice thing about standards is there are so many of them. Um, and as I started working, I've actually worked with Infocom on developing ANSI standards, I realized you have to kind of think about where standards are coming from, what they mean. The first thing to kind of look at, and I hopefully we all have these to some degree, is what I'll call local standards. Uh, these I've generally seen in our profession being two flavors. You have design facility standards, which is the infrastructure required to do what we need, and then you have technical or system standards. This could be specifying product, this could be saying these are the manufacturers that we support, and this also can get into full systems design. One of the things I think you guys have heard me talk about a lot, George Mason kind of almost embraces product lines with our classroom system. So the idea that we actually have these fully published system standards available so everyone knows what to expect when they come into a classroom. The next thing when you get into the industry is what I'll call declaratory industry standards. And these are standards where someone has said, this is the standard. And actually on the technical side, you'd be really surprised what is a declaratory standard. HD Base T that we're hearing a bit about at the conference is actually uh, you know, a company, Valens, who makes a chip for it, declared our chip is now the HD Base T standard. HDMI was actually done in a very similar way. It's a more of a consortium effort but there wasn't kind of a consensus in open development. There's other, uh, AirPlay is actually my favorite where Apple just said that. And there's also some that are developing more in the management side. Uh, the uh, AQAV, which is going to be a presentation on tomorrow, is another one which is emerging as a quality management standard in audiovisual uh, coming a similar way. On the de facto side, and this is kind of where I'll say HDMI started declaratory, We've lost the battle to get that Pro AV connector because at this point, any device you have coming up is going to have HDMI. So whether it's declaratory, it's now de facto, we're stuck with it. The last thing is something called what I'll say is consensus standards. Uh, things like ANSI, ISO, IEC, and IEEE actually have an open development process. So when you start looking at applying these standards, and the, you're starting to see more and more in audiovisual. Infocom now has a suite of four ANSI standards they're working on. 
and they also have, right now, one's actually about to start making its trip up to the ISO level to be an international standard. There's also other standards you may want to look at in AES. Uh, the Acoustical Engineering Society actually has a K-12 audio standard for classroom acoustics, which, while it was developed for K-12, has absolute application in our environment. So as you start doing both your facility standards and also your technical standards, you may want to look at third-party consensus standards that you can reference in your designs, where you can say, this is a measurable standard you have to meet and perform to. So getting into the architect portion of this, what we're kind of looking at is, why are we creating an architecture? From George Mason, these are actually taken from, uh, this is from our university classroom uh, technology standards. It's the idea of creating a common environment across all locations that meets the organizational need. Something actually Nick had just been talking about, the idea of this, this common environment. It's moving away from projects where you have one touch panel that looks one way in one room and another touch panel that looks another way because they happen to happen in two different semesters. You look at you know, adaptability design to address specific location needs. And that's where you get into the room specific. Sometimes, you know, screen size, but the idea is they're adaptable and standards aren't just these rigid cookie cutter things you just throw in there. But you're moving towards general functional principles where you're main, maintaining everyone is having this consistent, consistent experience. You also want to allow interchangeability between parts when things come up. And I'll get into a little bit more of this with our actual systems architecture. The other big thing we stress is reliability and high uptime. And the idea is you vet your parts. You actually, from the way we look at it, you maintain as small a list of parts in your entire environment. So if something goes down, you only have you know, a, the least number on the shelf. So you're always able to swap something in. It's not like you have to stock you know, 500 different AV parts. At George Mason, we have three standard projectors, which will meet 95, well, actually 100% really, of our circumstances. We only have a couple of switchers that we use. And we go through a long vetting and development process, which we'll talk about, actually Jeremy's going to talk about a little bit more as we go along. But the idea is that you're being very deliberate as you bring new equipment in your environment. And in the end, the goal is easy management of your systems. So as we start looking into a hierarchy, give me one click. Um, there we go. OK, so we have an overall hierarchy of our classroom, uh, classroom standards. And when you start looking at it, we actually divide up what I'll call our families based on what the code branch it is. We maintain one branch of code based on the switch in the room. It's just how we found how we do our design. But this allows us to create great flexibility. So if you go down one more level, give it a sec, okay. The stuff what you'll see in the darker blue are the standards we have in production today, and in the lighter blue are the standards we're developing. 95% of our rooms will fall into one of those three overall code branches and development areas. We do do one-off rooms, we do experimental rooms because it allows us to create something which we can see how does it work in a small environment and then take that kind of as an iterative design principle and move it out into larger designs. But for us, we're a Crestron campus and we've been very heavily invested in DM, so as you can see, all of our development evolves around DM. As you start looking into the actual designs, our baseline is our standard classroom. Functionally, what you're getting with that is a computer, a dock cam, uh, VGA, HDMI, RCA, auxiliary inputs. There was a VHS DVD, and that got unceremoniously booted this past summer, so that's now out of our standards. But that's our, our baseline. You go one step above from that, it's our speech room. We start adding audio lift in there. You then kind of go up a little bit higher along, and we start getting into some of our bigger systems, which are video conferencing or lecture capture. Right now, we're starting to migrate most of our product line from the 8xA product over to the DMPS 300 product. So what we'll start doing is retiring one standard and having another one come in. One of the nice things we've been <coughs> able to do as we're working on this is actually maintain the same user face from one generation to another. So from a faculty perspective, nothing changes. 
Everything under the hood has changed. But they can walk in a room, and they'll walk in a room we did two years ago, which will be on an 8x8, or this winter, which will be on a DMPS 300. And from their perspective, it's the exact same environment. Give me one more click. Last thing that this really allows us to do as well is put in a little bit of variation when we hit places where we need something a little bit different. Uh, our Mac classroom is a great example of this. Uh, we have Mac classroom where we need a little higher projection quality than we have in a typical classroom because they're doing Final Cut, for good or bad where Final Cut is today, but, um, and they also needed a DV deck. So that was not something we typically support, but we were able to incorporate this into our architecture because we had a little bit of expandability and it didn't require us writing a new set of code. We were able to add configuration to our already existing code base. Uh, similarly, we have this thing we kind of jokingly call the DM solo, which is our DM dual room, dual projection room, is a very elaborate and also includes furniture, includes uh, a smart tablet and, you know, just a, a kind of a larger environment. Well, we had a room which is a large lecture hall, which really needed that whole look and feel, except we physically didn't have enough room to put dual projection in the space. So we were able to roll it back, but keep the look and feel of a DM dual and what we ended up calling a DM solo because we only could fit one projector. So hopefully this gives you a little bit idea of how we're approaching an enterprise AV architecture. And it's something to think about as you start developing your systems. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy. All right. Do a mic check now. Does that everybody sound? You hear me okay? Okay. Um, basic principle that I'm going to try to go over on design, you want to try to strike the balance between forecasting user need and system usability. If you miss any one of these, you end up having a negative result. Um, failure to forecast means you have early obsolescence. In other words, it's supposed to last a certain amount of time and it's, you know, users will find it to be useless way earlier than, um, than you want that to be. If you don't meet the need, you get a great system with angry users which is not what we want either. Um, and if you failure to, to stabilize the system will eventually lead to a system that no one has the latest features, but no one can use it because it's above head. So it's tough to strike that balance. Usually you get close and then you try to uh, accommodate on one way would, would be through training to show people you can do this. It's not that hard. And you just kind of move forward in that. But you want to try to keep all three of those in mind as you're trying to design. <clears throat> um, one of the things that we did to try to help bring ideas together was um, VCU created a uh, simulation, uh, and I want to do a, a brief demo of that. Um, the, uh, there we go. What we did, we, I created, I'm a Crestron programmer, so I just created a, a demo file that had all of the touch panel files, all the X panel files, pretty much everything built into it, all into this one file that I turned it over to all of our our vendors and it's got everything in there. Um, when you open up the file, and I'm not going to go deep into this, so don't glaze over, just give me a second. Um, I open it up. We have a module that we put um, all of our room view stuff into and also a lot of common interest type things that we put into it. When you hit F1 on this guy, it pulls up a, uh, it'll pull up all of the functions that we have um, in the thing. Obviously, that's the help portion of it. But we've also developed a standard of uh, programming that's actually nine pages long of things that we've seen other integrators do that we don't want them to do. Stupid things like always make sure up is above down. Does that sound like a very complicated thing to do? It, it, it gets missed. And whenever we bring in a new integrator, I give this full thing over to them and this helps the programmers, but this other part is what helps other folks. I have a, uh, a simulation set up this is on an open IP address. I'm running on a Pro 2 that's in Richmond right now. And I'm showing you guys, this is how it works. We have, on our basic system, we have PC. Click the button, it says warming. It's not actually doing anything, it just says it is. I click it a second time and PC just pulls up. Um, we also have VGA, pretty simple, um, HDMI, video. Now, some people don't know what VGA and HDMI are, so we give them pictures. You know, that's, it's a, this is a learning institution that teachers should be learning too. But if we just called it laptop, it could get confusing down the line because eventually the, the 
you will, someone will buy a, v, a uh, laptop, they will not have the VGA on it, they'll wonder how to do, and we'll have to tell them it's called laptop, but you have to select HDMI, and it would confuse them even further. So this is part of that future proofing that we're trying to get to. Now, this is pretty straightforward. I hit the exit, it goes down, we're good to go. Um, and this just um, fun little graphic for, for turning this down. The other thing I wanted to show you was in, in the notion of scalability, this is a nine inch panel. It's much larger. You notice that the, uh, that the resolution is the same on these two, but the text is much larger on this one than on this because in real life it's actually bigger and we could fit more on the, on the other one. Notice this guy has a little scrolling bar. We made a little annotation there to let people know this one's a little bit different. So when you first pull it up, it says, you've got to scroll this thing. And we have additional stuff on this one. We have an audio page. We have lighting page set up. But if you notice on the previous one, they both are in with the exact same program as running all of this. We have pages that are built into it that will expand out to beyond what is even used in the demo. And we also have one other thing I want to show you was the video teleconferencing page. Um, it's just a set of three different pages, and they're all on a complete demo unit. So, I mean, if I had more time and this was what I was trying to show you, I can show a general user every button push that I intend to use. If you need to add to this, fine, but you start in one place. They all look the same. Also, I'm not a graphics designer, but we have one in our department. So I put him to work. I said, give me some buttons. All I've done to this is add the buttons that he had and kept a common ground with that. Oh, and also this little exit button right here was kind of a lifesaver because when this thing gets to scrolling, it's kind of hard to see where, where you start and end. And so you can always find that red part and you know where you start over. Anyway, one little piece of advice there. Um, that's pretty much all I wanted to show on the design portion of this. <clears throat> you want to choose, like Matt said earlier, you want to choose common, um, common standard components. You don't want to have three or four different versions of a of, of video projector. We recently moved from one, ver one manufacturer to another manufacturer, um, partially because ODU and George Mason were both using them. Found them to be very popular, so we decided, why not gang up against the projector folks and get together and use the same thing? And it's actually been very beneficial. We, the demo that we have actually uses the, uh, the, the module that was created by George Mason. We didn't have to reinvent the wheel, we just reused what they had. Saved me a whole bunch of time as a programmer when it came time to roll out our new, our new stuff, and it's worked great. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me learn how to cough with a microphone, right? All right. Um, overall, you, in addition to this, you want to make sure you're, you're viewing the campus as an entire system. Um, and I'm not just talking about like, you know, like a room view type scenario, which we do have, but the general concept that you don't just treat each room as there's a system in each room. The, the rooms are the components of the larger system. Go ahead and give me the next one there. The, uh, the picture I have here, if you ever have someone say, you know, can, you get, can I get a little help and, on doing something? And you wonder, once you find out what they're doing, you wonder, why are you doing that? And why do I have to help you? I figure that was kind of a fun little graphic of that. This is, these are people trying to walk across each other for some reason. And you come into classrooms and this type of thing is happening. Not exactly this, but you know, you wonder if they had asked you earlier if you might could have put them down a different road where it didn't look like this when you came in the room. Um, part of that is knowing who people are. You know, they need to know who to go to, how to go to. Um, and the first thing, I, the point I wanted to throw at you guys was the notion of no complaints does not equal satisfied users. Because if they don't know where to complain, they complain to people that create a bad vibe for you. They complain to other users, other people, and if they just kind of talk about it themselves, they get used to walking into a classroom going, oh, I've got to fight this thing today. And you need to earn a strong reputation early and keep it. The first experience of a, of a user will be their, what they guard, they, they use every other ex experience they have with it has to go off of that. It all averages out. And so if you've got a brand new system that you put out, but you don't do any training until three weeks into the classes because that's when things settle down, then you've got three weeks of people guessing at what button to push. Um, it's not something we would plan to do, but it may, it's something you need to make important on the front end of things. Um, I think that's where I, okay, sorry. <clears throat> so 
something that, that's obviously important that you wouldn't agree, uh, go against that, but it's, it, you need to fight for that type of thing. Um, monitor your rooms for errors and test um, systems weekly. Um, we, we do this, we actually have a, uh, a test mode built into our room view system where our students will go out, put the system into test mode, and that, keep, that, that stops all of the data collection so that it doesn't look like the slide projector is used once a week and we have to keep it. So we put it in test mode so that they go through and test every single piece and portion of it and then when they come out of test mode, it resets the day counter and when you go back and look at room view, it shows, it'll show zero for the rooms that were done today and if it gets up around seven, people know they're gonna get in trouble if we don't get that taken care of. And so we have a student force that's large enough to be able to get this down. We get all of our rooms done once a week. Um, the medical campus has fewer than, than that and they often have less things going on. They, they usually average around three days as a maximum. If it gets up around three days and we haven't been into a classroom, they start getting antsy and run out and take care of it. They just, they've been able to, they've got the system down and they take care of it and they do it. Um, by doing this, you catch stuff that users don't even know are out there. The ones we catch the most, audio. Audio completely dies in a room, not for microphone enforcement, but like to the, to the program audio. A lot of people don't use it, but when they do, they get upset that it's not working. And so we'll, we can catch that kind of thing on our own and say, wait a minute, this isn't working, fix it. They don't even know we did anything. We keep you know, a record of it and make sure all of it you know, keeps going. If they don't know what you're doing, all they know is they trust how you do it. And that, that works out well too. Um, you wanna encourage feedback and you wanna make sure that, um, that you are, <clears throat> when you respond, you give a reasonable expectation. You don't say, we're gonna do that to every person who gives you feedback because then you end up not being able to move through on that. You wanna say, what, we, what I tell people when they ask me, hey, can I do this, can, I, you know, can we get one of these in the room? I say, I will take this back and I will you know, tell people that this is going on, we'll keep this type of thing and we'll see. If a lot of people are asking about it, it'll probably make its way into some additional stuff that's coming you know, in the years to come. Now they don't like to know, hey, this is a year away, but at least they know you gave me feedback and I will put that on to something else. ODU is actually taking this up a step and it sounds kind of similar to, uh, to the, the Columbia State um, examples that I was seeing here. They actually have a, um, a technical advisory committee that is formed and kind of forced by the deans. The deans say who wants to be on this committee. Certain va faculty, volunteers, whatever, will get together and they will, they will present, they will get together, discuss and present what they want as faculty in the classrooms that they teach in. And so if someone comes and says, hey, I want to have this, um, Dwayne will actually point them back to their advisory committee and say, tell them because they need to know. Now the good thing is, if you've got one professor that wants one thing, and then he presents it to a you know, panel of his peers, and they're like, George, no one uses that, then that's actually a filter. You don't have to deal with that request because it went through the proper channels and got killed in committee before it ever came to you. It also gives them a chance to say, what else do we want? What else do we need? How do we like this? It's, it's the faculty themselves generating it and passing it forward, which I just think is really cool. And they've had a lot of success with that because they can then gather true information from the actual users that is required by their dean and then passed on to them as a report. Um, it seems to work out very well for them. Next, please. All right, staffing. Um, what I'm trying to get at here, the reason I've got a balancing thing, and no, I didn't just add this after the keynote today, but I did think it was kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> you want to have a balance of workload over people. And so part of, knowing, of getting that workload under control is knowing exactly what you do. Crazy as it may seem, we have about 200, uh, campus, uh, 200 rooms we support on one campus, 100 on the other. And then we've got a whole bunch that we kind of support. Y'all know those, the gray area ones? Now, I thought the uh, UNLV approach was really cool. In, in lieu of, you know, that gray area, we'll just absorb all of them. I'm like, that sounds cool. Because then you can say, I've got 500 rooms I can support. I, I forget the number, I apologize. But you know what, but the concept of saying, when in doubt, we will support it in some, whatever way that we can. We're kind of taking the, an opposite approach on this, which I'm not necessarily recommending, just reporting, that um, we are saying, these are the rooms that belong to us, that we will support. And these are the rooms we will no longer do because another group may have an interest in it. It may not be centrally scheduled. Whatever reason it is, we finally, after I've, like, I've worked for 14 years, we finally got that list done like a month ago. <laughs> and so now we have a metric to work off of. We can say this is who, who we support, who we don't. 
As soon as we published that, we had people going, oh, 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 you've supported this for years. You need to help us. You need to still come in. What I see coming from this is people saying, you know what? Here, it's yours. Do whatever you want to with it. Power comes to us. We have ideas. We can implement them now. That's great. And so after we get a full list of how many we do, we then say, boss, this is what we need. This is how many people we need to support this many rooms. This is how many we have. Look, oh, look, a deficiency. We need to add some more people. And then our workload gets divided up as a result. Um, same type of thing that works in tandem with that is defining such terms as acceptable downtime. Boss, how long can it be if a room explodes? How long till we have to put it back together? A week? A month? Is that cool? Um, no, it's usually about one class time, if at all possible. But you don't want to buy spares because, you know, even though we've standardized on this, we don't have any extras. Oh, so, so you, you know, you might need to put the pieces together for them and go, oh, look, yes, now we know we need to have a spare. They're expensive, but they're very useful if we're trying to work on a decent level of downtime. Um, the, uh, the, if it, imagine if email went down for an entire day, the heads would roll. It just wouldn't work. So they've got backup systems. We need them as well. Um, same thing for response time. Right now, I am embarrassed to report our response time because we are down behind a, a help desk rather than a telephone. So if someone has an immediate problem, it can, be, it can take a little bit longer for us to get because they'll, the help desk will get it, send a ticket out to our group. We might get it, we might not. Part of why I'm thinking of this is someone might see this on VCU side. I'm sorry, but it's a problem we need to fix, okay? So anyway, um, <laughs> we've known about it. We know we need to take care of this. What we need is one, option number three says, if you're having a problem in the classroom now, please press three and they would directly talk to us. Whenever somebody calls in, they know, first of all, if I'm ever in a classroom and I'm having a problem, there's an option for me. Every user gets to hear that. That's nice. And then second, there is something that we could work on and we can correct it with room view. We can correct it with over the phone. Have you turned it on? Yes, I'm pretty sure. Is the monitor on? No, then you haven't turned it on because the monitor is set to always be on if you ever have signal to it. Push and hold, okay, yay, and then they're good to go. 20 seconds, done, and they're happy because they called and got results. Name a little out of minute there, I'm sorry. All right, um, where was I? Oh, expect growth and prepare for it. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. If you, you know that things are gonna, are, whatever you take something, if you do a good job with it, you will be expected to do more of the same thing in another place, so just be ready to, to, to duplicate your efforts. Um, but know your environment and the resources because just because it works at VCU doesn't mean it works at ODU or Mason. We, we've already experienced that ourselves. Just because of the way the hierarchy sets, we can't do the same things the same way. We can have the same great idea and all think this would be the best, but it won't work to take it home. So we have to also change the way that we present it and make it fit into the environment that you have. That's very important. Start asking years in advance because if you know you want something, usually it's not going to work in this year's cycle, but you can start asking to the next one. This also works for uh, people who are wanting to get into, into technology but don't know how. There are things that they can ask for this year, get a, you know, a really, a grants and, and stuff. If they know the process, they can actually get into, get funding way earlier on if they just start asking. So that's kind of uh, there. Go ahead, next one please. Offer full training. I think I got into this earlier because I wasn't sure where it landed, I'm sorry. Um, after the large buildings are, are constructed, you want to make sure that you've got a plan for it early on. Um, what I would recommend on this as the best case scenario is pick a room that is similar to what all the other rooms are and plan to have that training. Do finish that room first and then plan to have the training in that room before classes start. Because you know on a large building, it's usually like they need to start um, in fall. They will go crazy and barely get that last one. If you're lucky, they'll get them f finished the night before classes start. That's not the time to have the training. You need to have it the week before, but you just pick a classroom that you want out of however many, let's say you've got 20 that are being done. This one gets done first because we're gonna be doing training in here the week before classes, and it needs to be bulletproof when we do our training. And if you can give that um, requirement as a project manager early on, this room is done first and bulletproof, it smooths a lot of things over because then you don't have to worry about getting the room perfect in order to bring people back in. Is that, is that jazz, does that make sense? 
Anyone else had issues with that? Yeah, I saw some very, very stern head nodding there. All right, keep your personnel well trained. Um, I am here because someone thought it was worthwhile to send me, and I've been sending email back the whole time that I've been here saying, this is a great idea, I just heard this, I was eating breakfast, this was cool. And you know, when, when you send someone away, if you're in management, you would send someone away, expect a report, and read the report, or you know, make sure that you use it and, and get them to train other folks that are there. Um, I've already got with the, the audio class that they did um, on Wednesday, was phenomenal. I mean, I would recommend it to anyone who had an opportunity to do it. They really did a good job with that. But I'm going to take the books and the information, all the stuff that I got with that, and I'm making a presentation either next week or the following, showing all of our other guys. This is exactly what I learned to the best of my ability. To, you know, to, I mean, I'm not going to be teaching the same class, but I, you know, there's there's good takeaways from that. And if you just send people, you don't have a you know some some of the higher ups would wonder why in the world you're sending folks. This gives you a reason to do so. So I think that's all right. Okay, so I'm going to jump back in here and kind of talk about the next area, which is our budget area. Um, very much as Nick was talking earlier, we've tried to go to the life cycle total, co total cost of ownership model. If you haven't started looking at your audio visual in that, please, please, please start. There really isn't a line between how we should be budgeting and how IT should be budgeting because the overlap between what we do and how they've been doing this very effectively for 20 to 30 years hopefully will help you strengthen your budget. At George Mason, we look at three vectors of total cost of ownership when it comes to classroom systems. The initial installation cost, the operating costs, and the replacement costs. And as you replace systems, this model continue, you know, it's a continual model. Replacement becomes initial and you start the process again. Once you get into operating costs, and something I want to kind of drill into a little bit more, is you have staffing, um, and staffing will vary based on your institution. The thing I will say that you need to include in there is staff development costs. For those of you who attended my other presentation on Thursday, one of the big things I talked about was reframing audiovisual at your institution. And it's one of the big discussions I'm having at our institution, but I've seen a lot right now in our industry is training costs for audiovisual staff. In my opinion, you should be budgeting the same funds you are budgeting for IT and computing staff for your audiovisual staff. The need that they have to stay current on digital technologies, networking, and some of the new applications and integrations that's going to happen over the next couple of years is no different than what it keeps for you know, your computing guy to stay current on whatever version of Microsoft Windows is out there, yet there's not the same appreciation often in the, you know, our organizations, institutions, that this training needs to happen. And it's part of kind of reframing the conversation and helping people understand that the level of complexity in our systems has, approached, has approached or exceeded the levels of complexity, in my opinion, in some, you know, computing setups. So it's something to think about as we're going forward as our profession expands, we're the glue, which means we don't need to know just computing like the desktop guys or just networking like the networking support guys. We need to know computing, networking, applications, AV, proprietary AV languages and all that fun stuff. So that's one thing to look at with uh, operation costs. The next thing to look at is also what it costs you to operate the department and also looking what it costs to uh, support your consumables and your maintenance costs and everything you make. So what I want to share today is what I call budget office friendly for con uh, friendly consumables formula. This is actually the formula we use at George Mason. It's what we look at is the hours of utilization of each room and I have this all on an automated spreadsheet. Uh, so we're actually looking at the actual utilization. We pull that from our registrar's database. Uh, we have set a normalized unit to however many hours of bulb life we can expect because it's our highest variable cost. So what we're actually looking at is taking all of our variable costs, putting our actual utilization from the previous year over that normalized unit. So say a room gets 2,000 uh, 2, hours of use, a bulb lasts uh, 4,000 hours, that means you're looking for that room at half a, you know, a, a unit. 
Uh, then you add on your fixed cost for us, that's telecom. It costs us the same to put a phone in a room no matter how much use it gets. And we can actually do a very detailed spreadsheet for our budget office, room by room. The other thing we add in, and this is on a per room basis, is repair costs. And we do that at 1.5% the uh, percent of the cost that it costs to install the room. That will not cover any repairs costs just for a room. A lot of these components are three, four thousand dollars. However, we look at that as an aggregate pool, and we've actually found that that will cover, generally, our repair costs for out-of-warranty repair in any given cycle. Um, replacement equipment is budgeted separately as, you know, as, as separate line items. Uh, we also look at replacement planning. Uh, you know, this is deceptively straightforward, uh, which is setting replacement dates for key items. This is our current cycle. We've kind of narrowed it down. We have five years on our projectors, five years on our computers, five years on our analog AV systems, which are all starting to get cycled out, and seven years on our digital AV systems. We used to get a lot more granular, and what we found is the budget office responded really well to three categories. So we make our budget office happy, and one of my personal narratives that I carry with me is what is the cost of replacing all of our systems because that's a very important narrative. Right now it's somewhere between five and a half and then six and a half million dollars to maintain our environment. So it's something that I always bring up in conversations because we never get 100% of the funds, but it's really nice to say, you know, we're funded at 80% of what we need to maintain, so be happy we're doing what we do. And it becomes a very powerful narrative with administrators and budget people so they understand that you understand the true cost of doing business. The last piece that we're kind of looking at with this model is what I'll call predict, which is your research and development, and really kind of looking into the future. Right now, AV product generations are getting shorter and shorter. You start getting product in, and by the time you think about deploying it, they're already on the second or third generation past what you were thinking about. Uh, right now, I think we're looking at probably an 18-month to a 24-month cycle. And unfortunately, I think that's probably going to get down even further. Um, I generally actually look at projector manufacturers kind of being that benchmark. And at some point now, I'm seeing that a model may only be available for 12 months to a year, or 12 months to 18 months at times. And you're already looking at you know, going to your next one. So it's something to pay attention to. And it's something that we had to look at. For example, when it went back to our architecture, we adopted first generation DM. We actually stayed with that for three years, even though the MAG and then the MAG Plus came out, because we couldn't keep on changing our architecture as fast as the technology changed. The other thing which we kind of get into in your research and development, and Jeremy talked about this a little bit earlier, is I really recommend using a prototype pilot production system. What we do is every time we're looking at rolling out new technology, we, we buy everything that we think we're about to roll out and we test it in a lab. And we make sure we can get it right, we get the code right, it may not be production code, but the idea is we verify we can do everything we need to do. After we verified we can do that, we generally roll it out on an unsuspecting faculty member or members. And we'll actually go into a production classroom, because we try to again keep the same interfaces, pull out whatever was in there, put the new system in, don't tell anyone, and see if it breaks. And the reason we do that is it gives a real world test and we eliminate any bias that may come from someone who thinks they're using a pilot system. What we found is when we tell them they're using a pilot system, something is always broken. So we actually did a very successful test. For two months, we took uh, our DMPS 8x8 out of room, put in a DMPS 300 this past spring, didn't tell the faculty members, and we finally brought our executive director in. She's like, well, what testing have you done? We were like, we've actually had it installed here in production, and until we told you, you didn't even know you were using a different system. At that point, you're like, okay, I really don't care, go ahead and roll it out. So, it's something we found that works really well. Last piece I have, and I'm going to run through this real quick, and I may need to look in because it's a little bit small on our screen, um, is kind of what I call the uh, crystal ball or the roadmap of technologies that we're looking upcoming. Um, the stuff in the near term, and this is stuff you should have a plan for today are things like digital, proprietary category cable solutions. These are some of the stuff we're seeing right now from Xtron, from Crestron, other manufacturers. While they all may be using common chipsets, they're not 
truly interoperable yet. The other big thing I've seen on the roadmap is particularly in the, I'll say under 100 inch diagonal space, direct view monitors replacing projectors in a lot of locations. As we move into kind of the midterm, and these are things you should be thinking about, start looking into interoperable systems like HD base T. Uh, we start looking into uh, streaming video. I think we've talked about that a bit at the conference, it's both distribution and recording. Start looking into what I'll call middleware, where you start looking at having databases talk to your AV systems. People have been doing this in little bits throughout, you know, probably the past 10 years, but there's some advancements in some of the control systems in the near future where you'll really be able to get into writing rich AV applications. The other thing which I think is going to hit us really fast and we won't even know where it came from is what I'll call hardware-based wireless AV. Currently, most of the wireless solutions out there are AirPlay, which is not fun. There's some stuff coming on the Intel side. I mean, there's uh, Witty. There's now Miracast, which is like Witty Plus, but NVIDIA is on board with it. And there are a whole bunch of stuff like uh, WHDI and a couple of other ones, which are hardware-based wireless right now, but there hasn't been any real adoption. Someone's going to get it right soon. And all of a sudden, we're going to have all these mobile devices with a really reliable, secure connection between their, AV, you know, your, their, their device and your AV system. So something to thought, start thinking about and looking at what's coming down the pipe. Kind of getting more into the long run, you'll have AV over Ethernet with AVB. Has it, who's heard of AVB? Seeing about a couple of hands. If you haven't heard about AVB, something you want to take a look at. It's an IEEE standard, but it's actually a series of standards for putting synchronous audiovisual over Ethernet networks. And there's a group called AV New, which is kind of the Wi-Fi equivalent like it was for wireless Ethernet, which will be promoting this. This is probably still five to ten years down the road, but in my opinion, it may be the end game from a technology perspective of a lot of what we do. The other thing to start looking at, and this is actually hitting the consumer side first, is greater than HD resolutions, 2K and 4K. Uh, you can now, I guess in Japan, get a 4K monitor for your home 55 inches for $10,000 may sound like a lot, but if you think about the technology you're getting, that's a real deal. And as we start looking into the retina level Mac displays, and someone wants to produce that pixel to pixel accurate in the classroom, you're going to have to start looking at some of these higher resolutions. And you'll probably see them actually in the display space before you start seeing them in the projector space. The last one is kind of a riff on what we've seen with bring your own device. And it's going to be something I think we're going to see a little bit more of a bring your own appliance. And that's going to be these streaming boxes, uh, just who knows what. But, you know, the, these devices where someone will just want to plug it in. But it's not your typical, you know, net tablet or handheld. It may be some sort of bridging device or something like that. So I think you're going to start seeing a lot more of those. And that's what's coming in. So. That's the end of what we have. I just want to mention one quick uh, website, something I launched earlier in the week. Um, AV Bach, the Audiovisual Body of Knowledge, is a website I'm starting to roll out. It's a human curated set of resources for supporting AV, trying to get people on board to help actually add information in there. So something, please take a look. I promise it won't crash this time. I fixed that problem. Uh, but. <laughs> It's something hopefully where if you start to look into a lot of the topics we talked about, there'll be a resource for further study. So I think we're going to take questions as a group now. Is that the plan? So thank you. If you could just uh, wait till I run over to you, because the session is being recorded and we want all your really good questions. I just had a question about staffing. So is there a magic number or a magic ratio of FTE to number of rooms supported? And if there's not, how would you suggest going about or putting something together to go forward to make a plan? Um, I guess I'll take the first swing at this one. Um, 
I don't think there actually is. I don't think there's actually an industry thing. I think at this point, we are doing such unique efforts at our campus. There, there's not that idea like desktop support where you could say it's that standard. That being said, you need to do whatever will get you staffing from your budget office. George Mason was very successful for many years saying 10 rooms meant one FTE. And we didn't always get it, but I would say at the end of the day, we averaged getting a staff for about five or six years at for every 15 to 20 rooms, we got an FTE. The challenge we had at the end is we got the wrong FTEs. They were only funding entry level technicians and we're now in a position where we have a lot of lower paying jobs where we actually need higher level skill sets and the salary isn't aligned with the skill sets we need. So I don't think there's a magic bullet, but steal boldly from other institution staffing plans and find whatever you can use with your, um, you know, your budget office. Here in the back. Yeah, I wanted to build on, on what Matt said. Uh, formula doesn't work. We tried it. We actually tried to get our folks to buy your 10 to 1 and they wouldn't <laughs> go for it. Um, it. It kind of embarrassed them a little bit though, I think, maybe. Um, what we've gone to, which seems to make more sense to our folks, is coverage. We need coverage during certain hours of the day. Right now, I'm working on more evening and weekend coverage because that's the only time we can get into rooms. That argument seems to be an easier one to make than just a, a plain percentage of uh, text to rooms. One other quick thing I want to tack on, because it's something I saw on the UNLV tour, which I think is at times underappreciated. Don't undervalue what your student employees can do. I can't even tell you how impressed I was by the UNLV student staff and yeah. just the professionalism they showed. And it's one thing I've actually talked with our people. I think often we depreciate what a student can do. And we're not getting the value we should be. And we're not giving them the experience they want from a job. So, you know, if we're, you know, stretched tight, don't feel bad maybe even letting your student take a shot at restaurant programming in a structured environment if they're interested in something like that. Other questions? Interesting conversation about staffing. We, we have some of the same issues. But going along with that also has, I, I get real nervous when I see life cycle with set years and set costs and formulas and stuff like that. It goes along the same thing with the staffing. It depends on what the environment is that you're trying to, that you have to work in. Um, and what are the standard expectations? What are the coverages and stuff like that? Um, and what is it you're expecting out of that money? Is it strictly just life cycle or is it there's some money in there for advancing what you can do and what you can, you know, experimenting and getting things going? Um, those are some of the things that we run into how do other people are taking care and financing those? I think part of the <clears throat> the, the question that, that that's, needs to be answered there is what happens, like, like you say, if we say it, it it's dead in five years, um, why is it dead? Is it because we expect it to stop working? Do we expect it to explode? Um, are we just expecting that it would be so antiquated that it wouldn't even be worth turning on? Well, we've got some tech. Does anybody still have 16 millimeters in any of their classrooms? I'm just curious. Oh, my gosh. We, we still have one. And we try to just check it out. But it's, it's there because some of the format can't believe. They're, they're reasons anyway. Um, so you can't just look at it and aggregately say, this is five years. And it's just like any target. You can do your best to reach a target. But if you don't even know what you're shooting at, it becomes very difficult to get anywhere near it. And so to set a five-year standard, this is what this would be. And like Matt says, he knows what his, his, his AV inventory is offhand. We don't. Um, we, you know, it's kind of like we have a set for, like we, we had a plan. I think it said within the next, um, I think it's in the next three years, we have to have digital in all of our, all of our minimal classrooms. Well, that's, you know, 300 classrooms. 
that's a whole lot to do in three years. It's very complicated. And so one of the things we did, we actually designed a system in-house. We got four integrators to start pushing stuff out. And we got 40 done in this year using one program that we had pushed out. We had previously been on a, a strictly project management basis, and this was the first time we got back to doing our own programming. And this, I was nervous. We had four program, four in integrators trying to do this stuff uh, the first time in just a week. And so that was one, it was like a lot of pressure on me as a programmer. Is this going to work? Turns out it worked great. And we've had, you know, minimal problems with that. Um, but in getting back to, to that, the, the question becomes what, what are you trying to aim for? And I think if we put a five year deadline on some stuff, some things will last longer. It, it may, we may go longer in between the next thing after digital, whatever that is. Maybe digital's the end of everything and we won't have to buy stuff ever again. Uh, we can always hope, but uh, we know better. Does that help? And okay. th then the, the other thing I'd add on there is it allows you to set expectations with your administration. When they tell me, or they tell our unit, we're only gonna get 80% of what we need to replace our systems. When the, when the faculty members say, well, why is the system lagging behind? Why don't we have digital in this room? We can say we were only funded. And it's not a shifting of blame. It's helping create an understanding. Um, our five years is actually largely tied into warranty cycles. Our, we've been guided by our administration where they have said, we want product under warranty. So we said, OK, you, that, that's your benchmark. We'll be happy to comply. We did push, um, actually, our digital systems two years beyond warranty because when this cost went up, we had to just get more for our money. We have one on this side. Then. I was just going to comment on the uh, staffing ratio question. I think that, I mean, that's come up for a number of years, and it's very difficult to define a particular number uh, through our industry because we all have different responsibilities and so on and so forth. But uh, what I've conveyed to my boss is the important thing is that within your campus, you, de you decide or you agree that there is a number. Now that number may be this or that, but so the point being, the next time you have a brand new science building come online and you have you know, 20 new classrooms, that that means something related to staffing. They just can't say, well, you know, it, it doesn't meet the number or whatnot. So that's all my comment. This is just kind of a, a what if question or a thing. In a lot of cases, we have those rooms that we've inherited that are old, that are, you know they're gonna be a high ticket budget item. You know it. And it's got, oh, three screen rear projection. It's got uh, seats 300 students. And it kind of requires you to make that decision. Do you wanna staff that with somebody or not? Because if the instructor hits the wrong button at any time, the whole system can just blow up on them. Do either of you guys have a room like that, and what do you do? I, I have a close scenario to that. I don't have an exact scenario, but um, the answer is we actually refuse to take on any room which will not fall in our architecture and have had backing from up to the vice presidential level of not just our vertical, but other vice presidents within the organization. Our math department somehow made a deal with the devil about 20 years ago and got their own dedicated 150 person lecture hall, which is just unheard of at our university. The registrar desperately needed that space for other people and didn't have access. They had zero money budgeted to maintain that space and eventually I think the projector actually like fell down, not on the student, but it, it just degraded to that point. And they came to us and said, well, you fix it. We said, absolutely not. And what happened at that point is we actually worked with a university committee and included people from budget, from facilities, and everyone else. And we said, well, we'll take it off your hands, but you lose it. And the university came through. I think they gave us, between our facilities work, because they did a gut renovation, plus our technology, the university gave us close to $300,000 to go into that room and gut reno it and put in our standard tech and then turn it over to the registrar. So we agreed to take it on, but we wouldn't take on a room we can't support in our environment. So it's, if the university told us they needed a three projection, you know, manual op room like that, we would actually talk about it within our architecture because we, you know, we're there to serve the university. But we don't get into these niche spaces that someone had a, had a whim at some point. And we've been fairly successful saying no to the odd and unusual. 
I want to comment on that as well. Um, at VCU, we tend to have a standard that, that we say, this is what we will support. If there's more stuff in it, like if a department insists that something else be in there, we integrate it into our system. They have to include us. And then if, it's, if it goes bad, that portion of it, whatever is required to upgrade or work that function, is then given to them as a budget, this is what this will cost, and they either use it and say, yes, we will do this, or they say, well, never mind, we're not going to do that function anymore. Um, and then at that point, you know, we would take, you know, modify the touch panel or whatever to re remove that function from that. And <clears throat> the notion of having people run a system, medical campus tends to do that more where they will have a booth and have someone doing it. But for the most part, we've adopted on the Monroe Park campus, which is the, the non-medical campus, um, they have, all the systems are designed to be used by the presenter. There would be one person that does that. And the intention is it's simple enough that can be taken care of. Occasionally, like in a large lecture hall, the professors will have TAs. And so it would be in totally, totally possible for a professor to say, just get one of their TAs to run the system. And the intention is to keep it simple enough that anyone could do it. That's, that's kind of how we have addressed that. And it's been a part of our system long enough. It's rare that we would have anyone insist on doing, needing particular things. We do meet with professors one-on-one -on -one in the classroom space. We will schedule that and go out and do that as often as they want to, because it means that we won't, event eventually we will not have to go into the classroom anymore and they will know on their own how to take care of it. Um, they'll also they either um, will get time on their own to do, that's rare that that'll happen. They'll either do it on their own or they'll have like talk to another peer, say, hey, can you show me how this, is, this works in this room? Um, but we always make that available. Okay, we probably, sorry, we probably have time for one more. Uh, this one's for Nick. Um, they, sorry. A lot <clears throat> more responsive than the one I had this morning in the other lecture. Oh. Um, the survey that you did uh, uh, of the faculty, um, I've been looking for a long time for a good methodology for developing quality metrics for classroom support, and that's the best I've seen, so consider it stolen. Um, <laughs> the, but uh, as far as delivering that survey, w was it sent to all faculty, or did you do statistical sampling? Um, do you expect it to be done repeatedly? And did you get any backlash from faculty from having to click that many check boxes? Uh, well, there, there were two surveys. Now, one was a generic survey sent with a generic survey tool. I think it was SNAP. Um, it got a relatively low rate. Um, a reminder kicked it up to about 15%. The other survey was ap actually an application. So it was a, a software application. People could authenticate using their credentials to the website and fill out the form, one for every classroom. So the first survey, every faculty member was invited to take. The second survey, the targeted classroom performance survey, uh, was done on an extract from the student information system, Colleague, so that we generated and pre-populated the database with the values like who's the instructor and where's the classroom, and they could only respond to classrooms they were currently teaching in. And yes, the intent is to repeat that. Actually, the way we've designed it, the 36 rooms that were renovated, we could just target the faculty who taught in those 36 rooms at the end of this term to see what the impact was on those 36 rooms. So yeah, I think it's a, a good tool. We did a similar thing at Pitt about uh, 12 years ago, and it worked well there, too. OK. I'd like to thank Nick and Matt and Jeremy. I'd like to thank you guys for coming. Give them a round of applause. And just a reminder to fill out your evaluation forms in your pen.